Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the IISS indeed. Um, my name is Antoine Levesque. I'm a research associate for South Asia here at the IISS. It's my great pleasure today to be your host um, for this conversation. Our topic is the Indian Ocean security threats, competition, and prospects for cooperation. Many of you are senior officials, diplomats, journalists, experts, regularly attend our meetings here in London. This dis discussion meeting today is special, and let me tell you a little bit why. At this year's IISS Shangri-La Dialogue, the Asia Security Summit in Singapore at the start of this month, a special session was convened on competition, cooperation in the Indian Ocean region. For the first time, this meeting demonstrated the importance of the Indo-Pacific security and stability to the Shangri-La Dialogue discussions. This large and diverse area, the Indo-Pacific, is a vital route um, for oil and cargo. It is the subject of multiple security challenges also. While there is growing evidence in, of India-China competition in the Indian Ocean, other important threats um, include nuclear weapons, piracy, illegal fishing, trafficking of narcotics, arms and people, and the dangers posed by natural disasters and climate change. Set against this context, this discussion today is special to us because it marks the launch of the new IISS University of Oxford multi-year research program um, on Indian Ocean security. This project, rather than a program, um, will highlight these multiple issues and how best to mitigate their regional impact. This project will involve original research, policy-relevant analysis, and influential publications. Today's session focuses on issues of maritime governance, collective security, and great power competition in the Indian Ocean. Dr. Kate Sullivan will reflect on the kind of order India envisages in the Indian Ocean, linking it with the broader Indo-Pacific concept I talked about. Rahul will speak on India-China competition in the Indian Ocean, along with options and prospects for bilateral cooperation. During the question and answer session, both Rahul and Kate will be happy to respond to queries and comments involving broader security issues, including how the varied threats um, and concerns in the Indian Ocean can be mitigated in the absence of an effective regional security architecture, how can maritime governance become effective? And also, what is the role of the UK-EU in the Indian Ocean? Rahul, as many of you will know, is the Senior Fellow for South Asia at the IISS and the head of the IISS South Asia Programme. He is known to many in this room for his published books on the Indian Navy and his work on regional security issues um, including India's foreign policy and maritime security in the Indian Ocean. Dr. Kate Sullivan is an associate professor in the International Relations of South Asia at the University of Oxford, a fellow of St. Anthony's College, and a consulting member of the IISS. I'm also told that she's about to be the director of a new centre at the University of Oxford. Not a new, Not but new director. A, a new director. Um, Professor Sullivan's research focuses on India's identity and state behaviour as a rising power, Indian Ocean security, South Asian nuclear politics, and India's role in climate change. Kate and Rahul, in this order, will speak for up to a combined 30 minutes. Their remarks and the subsequent discussion will be entirely on the record. Without further ado, Kate, I invite you to take the floor. Thank you, Antoine, and thanks for the fantastic introduction. Thanks to Rahul and everyone else involved in setting up this event. It's a pleasure to be here today, get out of Oxford at exam time. Um, if trade has been the engine of globalisation, it's the Indian Ocean that matters the most for the trading systems that underpin the economies of Asia. Um, and this explains why the Indian Ocean is emerging as a key site of regional competition. 
both the Chinese and the Indian economies depend on the free flow of energy, resources and trade through the Indian Ocean for their survival and their growth. Now Rahul is going to speak to China's expanding footprint in the Indian Ocean as a result of this dependency on the Indian Ocean uh, and some of the impacts of this. But what I'd like to talk about as a backdrop to Rahul's discussion are competing ideas about order in the Indian Ocean. Because when we think about security in the Indian Ocean, really what we're thinking about um, is stability and order. Um, but order is not simply about stability and predictability. It's about um, achieving specific goals and realizing particular values. Um, and the goals of order making and the values that they're supposed to realize are often different for different stakeholders. So I think we need to explore those differences and work out what different stakeholders want from the Indian Ocean and from order in the Indian Ocean. Um, we often, I think, see competition centered on key geographical features, um, such as choke points or strategic ports. Um, but competition, therefore, has a much broader uh, context. And the ideas of order that are currently circulating around the Indian Ocean are in flux, they're contested, um, and there'll be key sites of uncertainty and competition into the future. <laughs> So I want to speak briefly to three orders that I see either in formation or under contestation in relation to the Indian Ocean. These are firstly the strategic order in the Indian Ocean as it's perceived by both China and India. Um, I'd also like to talk about the Indo-Pacific order that some see emerging as a method to contain China. And thirdly, I want to talk about an Indo-centric cultural historical order um, that is being projected out of New Delhi and which intersects with the first and the second orders. I also want to explain what the stakes of these orders are and why they matter. Why am I telling you about them? So first of all, I think it's clear to all of us that there is a major difference in the way that strategic order in the Indian Ocean is being perceived by uh, and imagined by India and China. And of course, the view from New Delhi is that the Indian Ocean, uh, not only in name but also in geography, is India's sphere of influence. And if I can paraphrase the early uh, maritime strategist K.M. Panika, it is the geographical position of India which juts out far into the sea for a thousand miles that changes the character of the Indian Ocean. And this idea is um, manifest in the 2015 maritime security strategy document that India released. Um, and this, this idea of Panikas really uh, asserts that India's geographic centrality uh, means that India is well positioned to influence the maritime space um, and to promote and safeguard its national maritime interests right across the Indian Ocean region. Now, of course, in contrast to this view of the Indian Ocean as India's ocean uh, is perhaps the Chinese reading of its own strategic interests in this Indian Ocean maritime domain. The Chinese economy depends on access to the Indian Ocean to a very uh, extreme extent. China relies on energy imports from the Middle East. Um, China relies on resources from Africa and trade with Europe, of course, transits the Indian Ocean in order to reach uh, and be sent from China. And it's the transit of trade through the narrow waterway of the Strait of Malacca um, that is, of course, vulnerable to blockade, which led to former PRC chairman Hu Jintao in 2003 to identify the Malacca dilemma. And this is the problem that sea routes crucial to, to China's trade, uh, especially the Malacca Straits, can be subject to interdiction. Now, upholding order in the Indian Ocean for China means keeping its sea lines of communication open. Um, for India, it's maintaining preeminence over what New Delhi sees as its own strategic backyard. And of course, Rahul will spell out the details of this in a moment um, and how it's playing out on the ground. But it's clear that these visions are in competition with one another. Uh, with one another. A second vision that I think we're all hearing a lot about at the moment um, a second vision of order is, is a nascent and emerging one, and this is the idea of the Indo-Pacific. Um, and the Indian Ocean is, of course, nested, at least partially, within this larger order. 
Now, the Indo-Pacific construct um, is again uh, emerging out of, I think, a, a sort of material reality that we're seeing a vast increase in activity across these two maritime uh, and connected domains. Um, the sea lines of communication that link the two oceanic regions are critical for a number of major economies. And, of course, this greater interdependence brings strategic risk uh, and threat. Um, and so we have seen uh, recently, beginning in November last year, the, right, rev the revival of the quadrilateral security uh, dialogue between the United States, Australia, India, and Japan. Now, it's clear that these powers, at some level, are hoping to bring order to this region, this interconnect region of the Indo-Pacific. Um, and one of the essential uh, ways in which they are envisaging this order is through shared liberal values. Um, the four nations uh, have collectively committed to promote a free and open international order in the Indo-Pacific. Um, but of course, this idea faces, uh, we think, two key challenges. The first challenge is, of course, um, that uh, insofar as the Indo-Pacific construct is a response to perceptions that China uh, is deploying infrastructure development and investments in the region for geopolitical gain, um, that the Indo-Pacific is a response to this. And for obvious reasons, this is being read as an attempt uh, by some to <clears throat> contain China. So there's a clear uh, competing um, uh, view of the utility um, and the legitimacy of this order from a Chinese perspective. But the other way in which I think this order is not necessarily being challenged but is unsettled is the way uh, that India views the Indo-Pacific. Because, of course, the idea of the Indo-Pacific in a way that the Asia-Pacific terminology um, did not do uh, includes a rising India. So it seems obvious... Uh, given um, the fact that Washington, Tokyo and, and Canberra all see India not only uh, as uh, a possible balancer to China, but also as a country with clear democratic credentials, um, that India would participate in this project of order building in the Indo-Pacific. But I think we see here, again, a lack of consensus. Most fundamentally, all of these four quad capitals actually map the Indo-Pacific quite differently. So if you look at uh, recent US and Australian st uh, strategy documents, as Rahul and I do in our uh, recent survival piece, we see that actually the US and uh, Australia ideas of the Indo-Pacific stop short just off the western tip of India. So basically in western Gujarat and cut out the western part of the Indian Ocean Basin. Um, Japan's conception of the Indo-Pacific, if you look at its diplomatic blue book, seems to stretch from the west coast of the United States all the way to the East African littoral. Um, but as uh, Rahul and I argue, it's actually the Indian Ocean Basin itself stretching from the African littoral in the west only as far as the Andaman Sea that India envision, envisions as it's the era of its core strategic interest. Um, and this is reflected again in the 2015 Maritime Security Strategy. Um, where India's primary areas of maritime interest are centred on the basin itself. So while the Indo-Pacific idea is new and, and exciting, um, it's obviously very nascent, uh, and even at its most basic level, there's little consensus on its geography um, and the strategic goals that an order based on this concept would have. Um, at the moment, I think it's a... Uh, a sort of a pro, uh, provocative, incoherent um, vision, um, but it may settle into something uh, more defined uh, and more in line with the interests of those four powers in the near future. The third example of an order is one that I see coming unilaterally out from New Delhi. Um, and this is a, a sort of cultural historical order, and I think it's one that matters. It's centred on the telling of a certain history. And this is a very um, geographical and, um, I suppose, environmental uh, uh, narrative. 
And this is the idea that it's the natural mechanism of the Indian Ocean trade winds that have shaped interactions across the Indian Ocean over centuries. Now, this is, I think, a call for... Uh, an in, uh, it's trying to convey a kind of integrity of the Indian Ocean. Um, it's also trying to push India's legitimacy as the central and key stakeholder in this region by drawing on this history. And it's very similar, I think, to what China has been doing with the Belt and Road Initiative by uh, um, talking about the Silk Road and the ancient forms of connectivity and interaction and exchange of knowledge that comprise that route. So India here is doing something uh, quite similar. Um, this Indian Ocean narrative, based on this uh, idea of uh, culture and history and tradition, is being used, I think, primarily to appeal to other states in the Indian Ocean region. Um, it invokes uh, ideas of pluralism and acceptance and cooperation. And it's in many speeches that we see right now from Prime Minister Modi. So if we think of his saga speech, his vision, the security and growth for all in the region. Um, and if we think of several of the speeches that the Indian Foreign Secretary S. Jai Shankar has made on an Indian Ocean identity, this idea of the integrity of the Indian Ocean Basin is, is repeatedly underscored. So it's about appealing to Indian Ocean states, um, particularly those who are maybe facing a choice between uh, Chinese and Indian influence. It's also being used, I think, implicitly to critique China for what India sees um, as assertive and self-interested expansion across the Indian Ocean um, by stressing, uh, and I quote from a, a speech from the Foreign Secretary, that uh, India sees the Indian Ocean as a partner, not an arena, um, and that uh, any uh, security architecture has to be collaborative and cooperative. I think it's a, a, a subtle um, diplomatic critique of some of the ways in which uh, China's Belt and Road um, activities are being uh, seen. Um, but thirdly, I think it's also being used to exclude China from this sphere of influence. Um, in a number of speeches, we see... Uh, an invocation of the colonial legacies in the Indian Ocean, certainly uh, being critical of these, but suggesting that they've left behind um, a liberal architecture that uh, creates a, a natural um, mode of interaction between Indian Ocean littoral states, and also stressing the Indian Ocean as an English-speaking region, um, which I think is very interesting. Uh, again, uh, a shared identity, perhaps to the exclusion of China. Now, this cultural historical order is significant, I think, uh, for three reasons. Because it's reinforcing Indian and outside perceptions of India's declared preeminence in the Indian Ocean. And it's worth noting, um, because where external powers are concerned, so powers such as the UK or France, who would like to engage in a joint ordering of this ocean space, it's probably likely only going to work by invitation from New Delhi and in junior partnership. Um, the second uh, reason for the importance of the cultural historical order is, I think, um, that it's likely to provoke a Chinese response. Um, I'm not sure in which direction this could go, uh, because on the one hand, India is seeking, I think, partially to diminish China's status in the battle uh, for hearts and minds in the Indian Ocean, um, and in the past, uh, Chinese responses to India's status competition has not been um, good for New Delhi, thinking back to 1962. Um, but it could also provide cues for China to approach its uh, infrastructural developmental projects across the region in a, in a different way. Um, the third, I think, important aspect of this cultural historical narrative is, of course, the way that it chimes in with uh, discussions about the future of a rule-based in, rules -based international order or a liberal order. Um, and, of course, this is India signalling uh, to Western liberal democracies but also democratically inclined states uh, to its east um, that it is a rising power that wants to rise within this order and... Um, and do so peacefully. So overall, the picture that I've painted, I think, is one of contestation and flux. And um, solutions to Indian Ocean governance are unlikely to come quickly, and they're unlikely to come soon. I think they'll have to take into account India's preeminence in the region, or declared preeminence. 
They will need to take into account China's real strategic concerns um, about uh, the economic and energy dependence it has on the Indian Ocean region, and they'll need to address the concerns of smaller Indian Ocean states. But perhaps the first step is to understand that order and stability mean different things to different stakeholders, and that we need to watch as these change, track them, and uh, dedicate our attention to them. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Rahul, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as Antoine has uh, mentioned, I will be speaking on the India-China competition in the Indian Ocean, and I plan to, in the next 15 minutes, focus on three primary issues. Firstly, the nature and future of this competition. Secondly, uh, briefly, I think, India's successes and setbacks in countering China's expansion of influence in the Indian Ocean. And finally, opportunities for confidence-building measures in the Indian Ocean. Let's look at the first uh, part of this uh, uh, piece, uh, the nature and future of uh, bilateral competition in the Indian Ocean. I think it should be made clear at the very beginning that neither India nor China officially recognize that there is any competition between them in the Indian Ocean. But India's security establishment today is not simply concerned, but I would argue worried about what it sees as China's expansion of influence in South Asia and the Indian Ocean as an attempt to encircle it strategically. This is a significant change from eight years ago when there was no significant Chinese port project in the region, for example. However, China's security establishment feels that this is simply a result of its growing energy imports from the region as well as local infrastructure projects, including port development. The latter are stated to be simply commercial projects with no political, security, or military intent. Moreover, they have been initiated by host governments seeking Chinese investment. Nonetheless, India's anxieties over growing Chinese influence is essentially, I believe, a result of four factors. The first is the tense relationship with China, between India and China. This was clearly highlighted by the 73-day standoff against Chinese troops in the Doklam Plateau in Bhutan last summer. Since then, the two leaders have met uh, on two occasions, and there is clearly an attempt to lower tensions between the two sides. However, India's security establishment may not have received this memo as China continues to remain its single major strategic challenge, and that will continue to be the case for some time. The second uh, factor is, for India, is the lack of transparency and likelihood of debt in Chinese deep water port and infrastructure projects leading to political and security dependence of host governments on China. Uh, this was highlighted by India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi in his keynote address at the IIIS Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore earlier this month, along with his focus on a rules-based international order. Both essentially were thinly wheeled criticisms of China. An example that is well known, of course, is of Habantota port in Sri Lanka. The third concern for the Indian security establishment is the establishment of China's first permanent military presence in the Indian Ocean and submarine deployments in the area. China's first overseas military base in Djibouti, off the Horn of Africa, became operational in August 2017 and is expected to host several thousand Chinese military personnel and repair facilities for ships and helicopters. Chinese conventional submarines docked twice in Colombo in 2014. While China states that its logistic support base in Djibouti and submarine patrols are required for anti-piracy operations off the Somalia coast, India perceives the latter particularly as solely meant for intelligence gathering purposes. The fourth concern that Delhi has over China's influence in the Indian Ocean relates to China's superiority in warship building, which Delhi sees as eroding India's traditional geographic advantage in the Indian Ocean. My colleague Nick Childs, the IIIS Senior Fellow for Naval Forces and Maritime Security, puts it best when he says that since 2000, 18, for the last 18 years, China has built more submarines, destroyers, frigates, and corvettes than Japan, South Korea, and India combined. 
In consultation with Nick this morning, I can today confirm that the tonnage of new warships and auxiliaries launched by China in the last four years alone exceeds that of the tonnage of the total tonnage of the Indian Navy of the last 70 years. Moreover, whereas the current order book for naval vessels in India is about $22 billion, the annual capacity of government shipyards is only about less than $2 billion, which means that the lack of sufficient warship building capacity in India results in a delayed 12-year period for completion of the current programs that are in place. And most of the current programs are, in effect, patrol and coastal combatants, not <laughs> principal combatants. So what does this essentially mean? It essentially means that in the next few years, the Indian Navy expects Chinese aircraft carriers to cross the Straits of Malacca, Singapore, into the Indian Ocean for extended patrols and deployments using Chinese-controlled or Chinese-linked ports in Djibouti, Habantota, and Gwadar in Pakistan. This may well serve to erode India's current peninsular advantage of naval basing in the Indian Ocean. India's security establishment informally views this as the closing of a gap traditionally advantages to India via the Chinese Navy. As a result of this growing anxiety within uh, India over Chinese presence in the Indian Ocean, <coughs> India has now stepped up its own role and activities to seek to counter China's presence and influence in the Indian Ocean. This has had mixed results so far and brings me to the second part of the presentation on the successes and setbacks in this respect. In a sense, briefly, I think there are four key aspects here. First is India's attempt to selectively challenge China's infrastructure projects in South Asia with Indian alternatives, including economic support and port and energy development. And a classic example is the, the, the several lines of credit uh, that India has provided to Bangladesh uh, in the last few years and prospective investments in Sri Lanka as well. But it's still too early to judge the impact of this on the India-China relationship within the Indian Ocean. A second key factor for India has been it has made it, has, it, has made it a point of appearing as one of the first contributors to humanitarian and disaster relief operations in its neighborhood. And a key message here is of India's proximity and preparedness to step in uh, in relation to China in the Indian Ocean. And this has had considerable success. Over 90,000 nationals of India and other countries have been successfully evacuated from conflict and danger zones in the last few years, mostly within the Indian Ocean. But the political impact of this still remains to be seen. The third factor in India's counter-China strategy is the development of strategic relations with the US, Japan, and Australia, which includes bilateral and trilateral foreign ministry meetings and joint naval exercises in the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific. In late 2017, as Kate has mentioned, India was party to the revival of the so-called Quad grouping of these states with meetings of foreign ministry officials in the Philippines and Singapore. But I will argue that the security aspects of such a grouping has now received a major setback. When Prime Minister Modi failed to mention the Quad even once during his IIIW Shangri-La dialogue address to it, or even acknowledge, for example, the renaming a few days earlier of the U.S. Pacific Command to the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Instead, Prime Minister Modi clearly stated that the fundamentals of his vision of the Indo-Pacific were based on it being a free, open, inclusive region. And it's important to note the equal emphasis on the term inclusive. In pursuit of progress and prosperity, therefore not to be directed against any country, nor to be seen as a grouping that seeks to dominate. And fourthly, and most importantly, New Delhi has sought to expand bilateral maritime security and defense cooperation with island and littoral states of the Indian Ocean to become what I have termed a net security provider plus to the region. And there have been successes. There have been support uh, and provision of naval vessels and aircraft to select Indian Ocean states. Uh, there have been these hydrographic surveys with exclusive economic zones of the smaller states. And uh, as well, 
there has been a successful uh, 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 there's been a successful uh, use of pressure on Sri Lanka uh, to refuse uh, port calls by Chinese submarines uh, since November 2014. But there have been setbacks as well. Uh, I think the first setback took place in November 2016 when uh, Bangladesh acquired two Chinese refurbished diesel-electric submarines to start off a submarine arm um, in the Bangladesh Navy. India's difficult relations with the Maldives are well known. Uh, and it also means today that India's three existing radar stations in the Maldives, which are connected to India's coastal radar network, are unlikely to be operational. And plans for the construction of seven additional Indian radars in the Maldives are also on hold. The Maldives is also insisted on returning within the next three days two Indian helicopters on lease uh, by the Indian Navy and denying the extension of visas for 26 Indian Navy personnel deployed there. Uh, India's plans for the construction and upgrading of an airstrip in the Seychelles and the problems that's faced, again, is, is, is fairly well known. Uh, today, uh, Seychelles President Danny Faure is in India on his first official bilateral visit. Uh, but even then, uh, this issue has not been resolved and there is a Seychelles pushback on any attempt uh, to have uh, an a Indian-run uh, naval facility in the uh, Maldives. Uh, sorry, in the Seychelles. What does this then mean for the competitive relationship, these successes and setbacks, uh, for the competitive relationship between India and China in the Indian Ocean? And this brings me to the third and final part of my presentation on confidence-building measures. Clearly deepening competition between, between India and China, these two great powers in the Indian Ocean, with the risk of conflict, whether by miscalculation, misunderstanding or miscommunication, is in neither side's interest. In a recent article on India's perspective towards China in their shared South Asian neighborhood in the academic journal Comparative Politics, I sought to define the competitive as well as the cooperative elements of the India-China relationship as one of cooperation, a mix between cooperation and competition. And this is what I turn to now. In an important uh, op opinion piece in the South China Morning Post of 13th June 2018, uh, Zhu Bo, an honorary fellow with the People's Liberation Army Academy of Military Sciences in China, whom I had the privilege of interacting with at the WIW Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore earlier this month, wisely queries whether India can be open-minded about China's growing activities and even military presence in the Indian Ocean. And that, to me, is a fundamental question that I would like to respond to. Clearly, the Indian Ocean is not India's ocean. It is an international waterway through which two-thirds of global oil trade and one-third of global cargo trade passes. As a result, there will be international warships, including Chinese ships, traversing the Indian Ocean. There is no question of any official Indian denial on this. China's international trade passes through the Indian Ocean without a problem, as indeed does India's international trade through the South China Sea. But I believe there need to be several confidence-building measures in place, along with an improvement in bilateral relations, before India can have any degree of confidence in China's military and naval presence in the Indian Ocean. As of date, there is no substantive India-China confidence-building measure in the Indian Ocean. Indeed, I believe this should include three things. First, greater contact and communication links between Indian and Chinese naval and maritime security agencies on shipping in the Indian Ocean. What happens if there is a collision between an Indian and a Chinese oil tanker or cargo ship? Could India and China develop a joint incidence at sea mechanism to help develop understanding between the two countries and avoid misperception and miscalculation at sea. Second, the official level India-China maritime affairs dialogue needs to be rejuvenated. After formally announcing this mechanism in September 2014, no meeting took place for one and a half years, and there's been only one meeting since that took place in February 2016. There'll be no meeting after February 2016. Third, I believe there needs to be more transparency in Chinese activities in the Indian Ocean, including sharing of information on security-related infrastructure and port projects. Assessing options and prospects for India-China CBMs in the Indian Ocean 
is just one of the major objectives of the new policy relevant Indian Ocean Security Project that Dr. Kate Sullivan and I lead. We will also be focusing on issues of geoeconomics, political risk and international security in widely diverse and specific areas of the Indian Ocean. These are of importance to the banking and insurance sectors, energy and shipping companies and governments both within the Indian Ocean and beyond. Kate and I have conceived this project as being inclusive. We therefore invite participants in this room representing governments and companies to join Oxford University and the IISS as principal stakeholders in our new and exciting multi-year project on Indian Ocean security. Thank you. Thank you, Rahul. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, we now have just under 25 minutes for discussion. The first step to the inclusion you just referred to um, is to really open the floor to all of you, um, academic um, members of the IISS business um, 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 uh, operatives and indeed officials to really um, participate in, in the discussion. Um, I've seen a few hands come up already, but I would like to ask uh, the panel um, a first question of my own. I had the privilege yes, last week to be in Beijing and to take part in a discussion on um, regional security architectures. And I would like to ask um, both Kate and Rahul whether they think um, the notion of a regional security architecture has any relevance and any prospect in the Indian Ocean region. Kate? Yes, um, I think uh, using the plural uh, like you just did is a good start because there are several, um, uh, I think, um, multilateral uh, overlapping groupings that span the Indian Ocean. So we have, of course, um, the Indian Ocean, uh, sorry, the IONS, so the In Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. We also have IORA, um, and we have other organisations that, such as BIMSTEC and mm -hmm. SARC, which have um, access to uh, the Indian Ocean littoral. So I'm, I think uh, probably the first step uh, is going to be drawing on those uh, to foster, I think, shared conceptions of how to. Uh, bring security to the Indian Ocean. Um, and I think that that is going to spread uh, beyond the region as well as this Indian Ocean, uh, India, Indo Pacific concept um, gains ground. Mm -hmm. So I think at the moment we're looking at a sort of alphabet soup scenario. Um, whether there can be a new dedicated organization, um, I, I'm not sure. Um, but I think certainly the plurality of existing architectures would be the launch point at this time. Thank you. You've addressed the question of relevance and also prospect. So, Rahul, would you like to add to this? Sure, I try. I mean, I firmly believe in not reinventing the wheel, uh, which is why I'm now finishing the third book I've written on the Indian Navy. Uh, but in this case, <laughs> uh, uh, in this case, but things change over the last few years. But in this case, I firmly believe as well that uh, you know there are two organisations, the IORA and the IONS, uh, that Kate has referred to. Uh, I, uh, IORA uh, has, uh, has several countries as members, uh, China is an observer, uh, IONS has again several countries. I think it's important to strengthen these organizations uh, and I would uh, really focus on the IORA as being an important, as, as having a prospective uh, role in uh, key issues of maritime security. Maritime security has now been put on the agenda of IORA uh, but there hasn't been uh, tangible sort of progress. Uh, I would feel uh, that uh, a project like ours, I think Kate, could, uh, could actually look at one, uh, one of these issues could be on IORA or IONS, how to strengthen mm -hmm. uh, the mechanisms uh, and how to get other countries interacting uh, in terms of the membership and observers as this. So I would strongly believe that we have organizations, we need to strengthen uh, them as best as possible rather than invent new ones. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, could I please ask you uh, to uh, give your name and designation uh, when I call you? The first person to catch my eye was yourself, sir. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Abbas Faiz. Um, I was responsible for uh, uh, Amnesty International's research on a number of countries in South Asia, which include Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and of course, uh, the Maldives that Robert just mentioned. 
Uh, I'm currently actually engaged in my own independent research uh, on the impact of uh, China's influence in South Asia uh, on human rights. And, uh, and the, uh, my research indicates that, uh, that although there has been a lot of uh, interest and investigation into the um, kind of spread of China's economy and economic reign within South Asia and perhaps beyond uh, Southeast Asia, Africa, and all the other countries. Uh, something that has probably been missed by most of us, perhaps, uh, has been the political, uh, the kind of spread of China's political influence. Because we have assumed that China uh, only is interested in really developing its market. Whereas my own research indicates that the closer that the countries of South Asia have got to China, for example, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, the Maldives especially is a very important case in question, um, not to mention you know, other countries such as Myanmar, such as Nepal, Sri Lanka, and all of those, Sri Lanka under the Paxo. The closer that they have become to China, the more repressive they have become within their own political system. Could I ask you for a question, sir, please? More distance from the Western countries. I was just wondering whether uh, your research, either of your research, has uh, indicated or indicates anything like that. Thank you. I'd like to take a second question also. The gentleman at the corner. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Peter Asprey, um, member of the Institute. Uh, Somali piracy was a, was a good sort of uh, gathering point for everybody to get together and be friends or pretend to be friends or explore relationships. I just wonder if you sense any other issue out there in the, in the Indian Ocean which could provide a sort of a prime facing rallying point for um, Thank you. cooperative discussions. Kate. Um, yeah, so I think uh, we're not looking too much at domestic political influence of China's uh, increasing presence in the region, but although I was at a very interesting workshop on Friday um, that did discuss this in the context of Pakistan, which is, uh, and I think you're onto something in your research, but I won't comment on that directly now. Um, yeah, do we need more pirates? Is that the, <laughs> is that the solution to all of this? Um, I agree. That was a rare moment um, where powers got together with a common aim uh, and worked constructively. I think, you know, as Rahul signalled with his, uh, you know, the part of his presentation on confidence building uh, mechanisms, really, there are actually quite a lot of interests that people across the Indian or, or states across the Indian Ocean share. I mean, I think India's, depending on which data you look at, something like 35 to 50 percent of India's trade exits the Indian Ocean and go through the Malacca Straits. So clearly both China and India are dependent on keeping sea lines of communication open. Is there a way of working collectively on that? That would be, I think, one of the highest um, and, and uh, most um, uh, tension-reducing um, collaborations. But I think, you know, when we look across the range of, of um, non-traditional security threats that uh, Antoine um, outlined it, at the beginning. I'm sure there are multiple avenues. It's something that we need to look into more. But I agree that was a rare moment of success. Um, and in, in short of introducing more, more pirates, uh, we need to think uh, carefully about those convergences. I, I think in terms of uh, political influence, uh, yes, I mean, we've been uh, seeing uh, the economic dimensions uh, of, uh, of, of China's investments in terms of loans and uh, the sort of debt, uh, the debt trap that sometimes happens, uh, clearly having a political uh, impact. Uh, we've seen this in terms of, uh, of how I think there's a, a major New York Times story that's been running the last two days, uh, specifically looking at Hamantota port and looking at the, at the early uh, parts of the negotiations between uh, China and uh, the Sri Lankan government and the, and the very strong political aspects to that. Uh, but I think it's fairly clear that once uh, you have uh, economic uh, uh, debt uh, in that sense, uh, that there will be greater room uh, for other countries to maneuver on political issues. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think we're seeing more, we're going to see more of this. 
uh, because we've reached a certain stage on the economic loans and investments. So I think it, it's happening. I mean, and I think we will see more of this, but I'm not surprised uh, in that sense. I mean, the key, of course, will be on the security dimension. For example, uh, what purpose will uh, Hub and Total Port finally uh, serve? Uh, uh, what about, you know, we know of Djibouti already. Could there be sort of uh, relationships there? In terms of uh, uh, the issue, uh, as Kate said, uh, more pirates, I think uh, what is important today, I think the, the, the I think what we are seeing is a new great game of sorts in the Indian Ocean, where there are clearly countries, major powers, India and China, are in competition whether we like it or not. Uh, uh, there will be uh, key dimensions, economic, political, security aspects. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it's there. It, it just may not be fully labeled as such. I think it's very important to ensure that that competition is mitigated as best as possible uh, through uh, confidence building measures, uh, through uh, an attempt at, at putting together uh, a decent regional security architecture. Uh, so I think in a way that the new, uh, the new sort of big picture issue we're looking at is not the piracy issue at all. It is really how these two large countries, I mean, you know, 20% of the world's economy, 40% of the, of the world's population, how they interact in the Indian Ocean region, particularly now, and the impact that has for Asia security. Uh, as, uh, as Zubo, uh, the, the, uh, the PLA official I mentioned, uh, has also written his article that actually uh, the nature of this relationship between India and China uh, will actually ensure whether it is Asia century or not. And I think this is the big picture for us today. Thank you. As you can see, we have nearly as many questions as answers, and this is good for this project and its prospects. Um, we now have 15 minutes uh, or so left. I'd like to take two rounds of questions with um, answers interspersed. So first, I'd like to take uh, four um, questions in, in one go, and I insist questions. Um, the second person, or the third person to catch my eye was the gentleman here on the second row. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Gordon Wilson. Uh, Hello, Rusi, a member here, former naval person. <coughs> um, thank you both for your addresses. And uh, what I want to uh, look at is in the very impressive role, you know, the string of naval officers we had here, both serving and retired, who have come and addressed us. <coughs> Going back to 10 years ago, I think, when the, the gentleman became Chief of Defence Staff, gave a brilliant address. The philosophy there is rather mahane in it, what you see coming across from the Indian. And it was an impressive shipbuilding program because he's in trouble, as he pointed mm. out. Mm. This would say about the <coughs> server, we're looking at this as a, a maritime thing, be the prime element of def Indian defence strategy. Now, is this so? Mm. I hear that uh, the army take far more of the resources, disproportionate share. Is Modi really genuinely uh, driven by this maritime perspective, or is he, is he in still? maybe controlled by the military to give much more resources there when perhaps they're not deserved if you look at the overall nature. Thank you. There was a hand at the very back. Ah, oh, I have two hands. Um, could you please um, establish between yourselves who is the um, first uh, of you two who emerged? I think at, near the window, I think. Please. Uh, Paul Mitchell, European Union, name for <coughs> Um, I'm curious that although the discussion has been focused on China and uh, India, clearly there are other players, um, and not least the European Union, uh, present in the Western Indian Ocean at least. Uh, given the amount of money that's being pumped in through, through the EU, uh, particularly through French um, influence over the EU, which would be better for Britain? Would it be to see an Indian role or a French European role take precedence in the future? Thank you for that question. I've just written something on this and published it in Brussels, so that's excellent. Uh, the next person on my uh, list was the gentleman on the third row, I think, yourself. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mark Evans, from the South African High Commission. Thank you for the words. For I just want to pick up on a couple of things. You mentioned, for example, Djibouti and the, the first places there. Uh, to what extent do you think is there a danger of this competition spilling over into an Indo-China race spot scramble for Africa? They both have clear economic interests, as you have uh, as you've pointed them out. Um, but there are other players as well, even the, the, uh, Japan now, which has a, which under the, the, the Pacific uh, China, uh, Indo-China, uh, Indo-Pacific, sorry, uh, umbrella is now also looking 
much more into, 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 into Africa. So, and, and they do have some structured engagements with Africa, both of those parties. But can that structure hold? Would, 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 would they, at some stage, maybe feel they need to go out of those into a more beauty context? Beauty context uh, with, with various African countries and organizations? Um, and, and you did mention, for example, IORA, and thank you very much. Um, IORA though, contains two of the quadrilateral parties, Australia and, and India. Of course, the U.S. also has some interests, etc. To what extent is it really feasible that that could become uh, a one of these structures that you you refer to the security structure, um, <coughs> given that there's quite a bit of competition from the outside to perhaps keep out the Chinese? Et Thank you. And finally, on the first row. Thank you. I'm Adil Sultan from King's College. Thank you for the presentations, Rahul. Uh, you always come up with optimism. That's the, the beauty of your presentation. Thank you very much. But my question to Kate is, uh, it was interesting to bring out this competing perspective of how we define regions. So I was wondering, regions, as we know, are, are dependent upon securitization priorities of different states, and they are built on tangible elements. Of course, economy is one, but not the only one. So in that terms, if you see, is this transformation from Indian Ocean to Asia Pacific is more of a kind of a image building exercise to project India as a big part. Because if you see on ground, India is not going to fight a war with China, never. It has economic interest in Asia Pacific. But it is not going to entangle itself into a military conflict, a hardcore military conflict, Asia Pacific. So this transformation from Indian Ocean to Asia Pacific. How much truth is there, or is it just a kind of image building exercise? Thank you. I'd like to revert to the panel for um, up to two minutes each mm -hmm. in the reverse order. Rahul? Sure. Let me take two questions then. Uh, so one is in terms of uh, uh, India's, uh, uh, you know, uh, has Modi's perspective shifted from landward to seaward? Uh, the first major speech uh, that Prime Minister Modi made. Uh, uh, on security issues was at the Shangri-La Dialogue earlier this month. And uh, in India, uh, analysts have interpreted it as India's maritime sort of, you know, security uh, scenario. I think there is a shift. Uh, I've never seen any Indian government uh, understand uh, the importance of the ocean and the waters as much as this government has. Uh, the first uh, speech uh, given by any Indian Prime Minister on the Indian Ocean uh, was given by Modi uh, two, three years ago uh, in Mauritius. The problem, of course, is that there are clearly uh, uh, key stakeholders uh, and equities at the moment. Uh, the army uh, has, uh, does get a large, the largest per percentage of the uh, budget. It's not going to be easy to shift that uh, on the basis that uh, uh, China, uh, which is India's major strategic challenge, uh, you know, India also has a long, as you know, uh, troubled border uh, in the north. Uh, but I think what we are seeing is a mindset change within the Indian security establishment that is really sort of moving from a, a primary, predominant focus to the, from the land to uh, the uh, the oceans. Uh, and I think that is 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 important. But the implementation of this will take some time. Uh, briefly on. Uh, uh, on IORA, uh, I think uh, it is very important to have, uh, uh, to get ideas how to build uh, more effectively and manage more effectively sec the security issues within the IORA. I think IORA is an organization that for years has been neglected. I remember giving lectures uh, at the Foreign Service Institute in New Delhi in the early 90s on IORARC, which was the earlier name of the uh, IORA. And there was no interest <laughs> in that sense. Uh, I, I think that the minute you included maritime security in the agenda, I think there is interest. Uh, but I haven't seen anything yet uh, where there is a very clear focus on expanding or, or even making the IOR more effective. This, I think, is something that, that needs to be focused upon. Thank you. Kate? Um, yeah, so uh, Adil, to respond to your question, I mean, I think, I don't think that we are seeing a transformation, uh, a transition from an Indian Ocean focus to an Indo-Pacific focus. I think what we're seeing is 
um, the Indian establishment leveraging this new conversation about the Indo-Pacific um, as a way, as you say, of building an image rather than as a strategic kind of new focus or redirection. Um, and I think, you know, I alluded to that in my presentation that there are messages that in India is sending out to different audience, audiences. The first audience is, of course, um, the, the sort of club of, of leading powers that India wants to uh, be part of. Um, and that is centred, again, on this idea of a participation in and a support of a liberal international order, um, probably implicitly suggesting that India, uh, sorry, that China is not supportive of that order. So embracing this Indo-Pacific idea um, rhetorically serves that purpose, that signalling. Um, I think, you know, please do refer to mine and Rahul's piece because I think we argue there quite um, robustly that India's strategic interests uh, don't necessarily are not directed um, sort of east of the Malacca Strait at the moment. So India's strategic focus remains within the Indian Ocean um, region. Um, and I think that the other reason why the Indo-Pacific discourse matters and why this signalling of, of a rules-based orders and the importance of UN CLOS and in maritime uh, international law is, of course, to reassure uh, smaller powers within the Indian Ocean region, perhaps not Pakistan, um, that India's intentions are comparatively benign. So I think we need to distinguish between what is political rhetoric that has real you know, world influence and messaging and what is actually the sphere of strategic action, um, and I think the Indo-Pacific is the former and the Indian Ocean is the latter. Thank you. We now have only five minutes left. I have too many uh, hands. Um, I would like to call first um, you, sir, and followed by you on the first row. Both officials, I understand. Uh, thank you, sir. I'd like to ask, there uh, uh, is some trade tension growing between India and the US, and it's possible that uh, even uh, some kind of trade war broke break out between these two countries, and the US is criticizing a lot of Indian trade policies uh, domestically. So um, I'd like to know what kind of impact uh, uh, it could have uh, on India's uh, attitudes or policies towards this kind of Indo-Pacific idea or Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir? Yeah, uh, uh, Nawaz, uh, going with the argument that India considers Indian Ocean and India's Ocean or its sphere of influence, so one would assume that uh, it would be wary of uh, the presence of any other power in, that, in the Indian Ocean region. You know, when we have talked about China and its presence, do you see a similar reaction, you know, uh, from India in case of presence of other extra regional forces in the Indian Ocean region, some of which already have bases and some, some of which are actually investing in developing new bases to support their aircraft carriers or to sell or whatever, specifically targeted against China. Thank you. And finally, uh, I, I'm a warrior, director of the news in as well, but um, segments, you know, a bit, I've already been actually asked in different questions, but my question is specifically mentioned that. Is this uh, you know, feeling of competition or uh, you know, confrontation within the Indian Ocean region is inherently uh, you know, domestic, originating within the region, India China, or are there elements, and I'm just referring it to the speech which the Secretary of Defense Matters made in Singapore, that uh, a single country cannot be allowed to dominate this region, that maybe it's the attempt by other uh, stressed economies like America and Europe, to you know, sell their you know, most exp expensive toys to uh, you know, these countries by saying that, listen, we might be fighting tomorrow with these other toys. Thank you. I need, unfortunately, to close the list of questions here. I'd like to revert back to the panel for final responses. Um, Kate, would you like to start? Yes, your, your question has just launched me into deep thought. Um, so if I can respond to yours uh, first, um, I think, you know, one of the reasons why India has never engaged in a formal alliance with any power, including currently the United States, is precisely so that it has uh, strategic choices. It can um, engage in... in small trade wars, if you want to call it that, or there can be minor disputes, um, uh, such as the uh, Debiani-Cobragadi case a few years ago. Um, and 
that the relationship can weather these uh, small incidents. And I think um, India has been reluctant to embrace the Quad. It's um, reluctant to in- in- embrace these security alliances, not just because of the fear of provoking China, but because um, to do so would impinge directly on India's strategic space, which it guards still, I think, very uh, zealously. Um, your question requires um, a lot more thought, I think, but I think there is an element to that. Um, I think, you know, India and China in some ways are, are similar in that they're signalling um, their rise in, in different ways. Um, and I think that uh, th- that will always be a response to um, discourses um, and um, uh, forces of destruction sales <laughs> that are coming out of other parts of the world. Um, Absolutely, and I think to, to make sure that we always see the region embedded in this broader global context and in relation to the interests of major powers is absolutely critical. So thanks for reminding us of that. Thank you. Rahul, final yeah, word. Sure. Just uh, in terms of the India-US uh, trade tensions, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not an economist, uh, but, but I think if you put it in a larger context, uh, we'll have to see what, what the actual sort of concerns are and, and you know, what it actually means on the ground uh, uh, you know, if and when uh, it takes place. Uh, but I would just also draw attention uh, that even though there are differences on trade issues clearly uh, currently, the defense and security relationships continue. So, in fact, uh, next week uh, we have for the first time a 2 plus 2 uh, meeting where the Indian defense minister and foreign minister fly to Washington on the 6th of July to meet. Uh, the U.S. Defense Secretary and the U.S. Secretary of State. So the first time a 2 plus 2 mechanism to actually look at some of the defense and foreign policy issues. Now, the question I would put to myself with, with more uh, sort of expertise on this is, is will the economic issues and the, and the developments impact negatively on the 2 plus 2 meeting uh, and, and what India and the U.S. are looking forward to the future? My sense at the moment is that it will not, uh, uh, but uh, we'll have to see how, how, how you know, the, the twists and turns that take place in the India-US trade relationship. But in a way, uh, there is a sort of uh, compartmentalization on defense and security issues uh, between India and, and the US on this. Thank you. This is all we have time for. Um, really, I'd like, um, I'd like to thank you all um, for um, bringing to the table uh, of this launch event um, so many questions, but also so many mentions of different stakeholders, because I think it's important to reflect the complexity of what it is this project will be looking at. And clearly, um, it will not be too much to have both um, academic and um, a think tank expertise come together in uh, policy relevant uh, and useful uh, scholarship to really uh, address those questions uh, which are of relevance to policymakers, but also to business uh, and other uh, interests in the years to come. With this, I'd like to draw this meeting to a close. Um, well, I'm, I'm sorry, we're out of time. Um, could I ask you to join me in thanking our two speakers and bringing this event to a close? Thank you.